Run it up, then run it back. Yeah. Run it up, then run it back. Run it back. Run it up. Good run Wednesday morning and welcome run to up, run, run It Back. back. Yeah, yeah. It's our Friday. Yeah. I always say that. It's confusing to some, but that's okay. Here we are. Evan Turner, Chandler Parsons, Eddie Gonzalez, Michelle Beadle, Sean Sharania joining us fresh off the most wonderful night of the year out in Chicago. So we'll be getting to that right away. But first, <laughs> first we had basketball last night. So we just got to get through that before we can get to the really cool stuff. But uh, yeah, Lakers, Denver, finally we got hoops back. We have things to watch at night. Uh, and this was fun. Look, Lakers, they were down big, put up a big fight from a 21 point deficit, but the Nuggets did take game one, 132, 126. Mm. Jokic, 34, 21 and 14, a third straight triple double of the postseason. In the third quarter, uh, he out-rebounded out the entire Lakers squad going into halftime. KCP on his teammate uh, and what it's like playing with LeBron. I feel like the only difference is LeBron can jump higher than Jokic. That's the only difference, you guys. Um, this is such a fun time because of all the MVP talk, and now it's behind us, and here we got Jokic. Is he the best player on the planet right now? Right now, yeah, sure, because the MVP is, is not playing anymore and he's been sent home. But it, it's unbelievable. What this dude did last night is is insane. It's one of the best individual three-quarter performances <laughs> I've ever seen in my life. The way he controlled the game, the way he would get out on the break, facilitate, dropping dimes out of double teams, some of the shots that he was even taking, let alone hitting. I mean, he had he had eight points, 12 rebounds, and five assists through the first eight minutes of the game. He had a triple-double midway through Amazing. the third quarter. Uh, and he don he was he was defending, he was covering pick and rolls a lot better. The, the shots he was even hitting were, were just absolutely insane. And it's crazy because he played so good. So did Anthony Davis, and we're not even <laughs> talking about him because as well as AD played, Jokic dominated the game, and they got a lot more from the other guys, and it was a full balanced attack, and the Lakers can't afford to trade baskets with this team. They're too elite, they're too good, they play too unselfish, and they're going to have to find a way to get back in transition and slow them down, but man, Jokic was insane. Fun yeah, to watch. I agree. Jokic was unbelievable. I'm not ready to call him the best player on the planet yet. <laughs> he still got a little bit you know, uh, more basketball to play, but... Is he on your top five of current players? Yeah, I'll, I'll squeeze him in there. You know I mean? Okay, fair enough. Five, He's got to be top five. Be top got, top one of those got five, six around there. But, you know, last night was just an unbelievable night. Like you said before, Anthony Davis had an amazing game, and we can't even start to talk about him until we pay Jokic his homage. Mm -hmm. I didn't see a 31, I think I tweeted, 31, 21, 14 game coming or whatever it was. But uh, unbelievable night. The way he commands <laughs> the game is just... It changes the game. He makes everybody play at what his is own he talking pace. About? What? Because he's Superman. <laughs> oh, he's the it. only one that can stop him. Got it. He <laughs> makes... Wow, over my head. <laughs> he makes the game slow down for him. And it's it's so impressive to watch, especially at this stage, against the players he's playing with, the guys who are defending him. And you have to adjust on the fly. And credit to Darvin Ham, he made adjustments. And, and the Nuggets will have to now counter that and tinker with that. But... It's uh, it's just it's just amazing watching what he's doing. And he at halftime, he has like 15 and 17. It was like, is he gonna score 40 and 40? Like, what is this what the game we're gonna watch right now? Um, but you know, credit to the Lakers for fighting back against that big start that they had to go against. Yeah, that was a quite the deficit, Shams. 21 <laughs> points is no joke. Watching a Lakers 21 point deficit game in the playoffs in Los Angeles is interesting. Uh, how how was Denver able to do what they did so quickly? Well, I mean, Nikola Jokic, historic performance, literally, like Chandler said, and then I, I've never seen this. Ten rebounds, five assists, two blocks in one quarter. First player ever in the last 25 years in the playoffs or regular season. So Nikola Jokic, the numbers he put up, uh, those were great. And Anthony Davis had a big-time game, and we didn't even pay much mind to it, I think, overall in the aftermath of it. But I think when you look at the Lakers, I talked about it yesterday, them deciding who to start was going to be big. They ended up starting small with three guards, D'Angelo Russell, Dennis Schroeder, um, as well as Austin Reeves. And I think going into game two, I'm very curious because Denver's a big team. They've got KCP, Aaron Gordon, Michael Porter Jr., Jokic, Jamal Murray. How do you match up with that phys uh, physicality, uh, that length, uh, athleticism um, in the starting lineup? So Darvin Ham's going to have some questions potentially to answer uh, going into game two. 
I know you have a play you want to share with everyone. Yeah, so there was a one play that stood out with me last <laughs> night, and this is just things that the Lakers can't afford to do against the team. First of all, they can't have live ball turnovers like this. They have athletic wings like Pope, like Bruce Brown, that can get in passing lanes and get in transition. Now, this is just the definition of a perfect offense here. It's unselfish. Oh, they share the ball. They don't care who scores the basket. And then if you watch the Lakers, nobody's sprinting back besides Austin Reeves and a little bit of Rui there. They can't afford these plays. Like I said, the Nuggets are way too good offensively. They share the ball they make the extra pass and now they have these athletic wings they're making shots the Lakers have to find a way to limit their transition buckets but the way if they move the ball like this and they play this fast this is this is gonna be a quick series Ooh. I, I think the number one thing is just the Lakers getting their legs under them okay. um, we of course I don't want to make excuses but to be in that altitude after you know such a crazy series last series of course the guys are gonna come in a little bit fatigued and when you're going up against such a great offense I mean, it's a perfect combination to have a, you know, a couple tough road games. But I think one thing that occurs is uh, the experience and, you know, the realization of, you know, LeBron understanding you can't go down 2-0. And, you know, I know yeah. guys hate seeing it, but I believe the Lakers are still locked in. Everybody's together, and they're truly intent on trying to win this game and figure it out. I mean, look, they were down 21, and it pains me to say anything positive at this point, but they only lost by six. Yeah. So are you pessimistic or optimistic if you're Los Angeles? Well, I'm optimistic because they did make some changes. They put Rui on Jokic. They didn't allow him to bring the ball up, and he did a really good, uh, good job trying to be physical with them and not letting it be so easy. Um, and they did. They, they fought. They, they, they scrambled around. They started playing harder on defense. They started making shots. They were getting good shots early on when they were going through LeBron in the post. They just weren't making, they weren't knocking down the jumpers. So it's definitely, at the end of the day, they, they got dominated for most of this game and they gave up 72 points uh, in the first half and this is the most points I think the Nuggets have ever scored in the history of their franchise through <laughs> three quarters so no team is going to be able to sustain that and win many games giving up that many points. Yeah the the Swiss to Rui is, is smart and you get AD off the ball I think it also helped them rebound like he was getting killed having to close out on shots and then Jokic is in the paint just grabbing every rebound in sight. Um, they still got out rebound by 17 rebounds last mm. night, and the Lakers aren't accustomed to doing that. They, they won the Warriors series by by packing the paint, by getting the boards, by by doing that. And Jokic is just a monster. You you have to accommodate for that if you're going to do that. I think, look, there's simple fixes for the Nuggets. They can just outright post Jokic on Rui. He he can't do nothing about That's that. Fine. Space out and get him doing that. They run pick and rolls with other guys. I think the answer that we eventually have to come down to is if the Lakers want to play this style of defense and they want AD off ball away from Jokic, it's going to fall on LeBron. Mm -hmm. He's going to have to be the guy who's going to guard him. He's going to have to be out there guarding pick and rolls. And <laughs> can he do it at this point? Even with Rui doing it, LeBron will probably have to guard Mark Michael Porter Jr., who's going to move a lot off ball. He's going to take a lot of shots. And they're going to have to test him. So we're going to see. I mean, I think LeBron will step up, but can he at 38 years old? I think this is the only time. Obviously, it's his legacy. I think, um, you know, the number one thing is they're so close, the confidence factor and everything, you, you, you know, you factor in. I believe they're going to figure it out. LeBron can step up, be able to, you know, defend. You remember back in the day versus Spurs, he's able to shut down Tony Parker. In I the don't final remember minutes, that. Is but, that <laughs> that's awesome. But, but for sure, they have their, you know, they have their, their plate full right now. Their offense is clicking. The Nuggets offense is clicking. And you, everybody has to be ready to guard a full 48. I mean, something happened at halftime, right? Like, something good happened in the Lakers locker room at halftime. Well, I mean, listen, they weren't going to go get embarrassed. That, that, that had already happened the first half. It was only up from there. And again, the third quarter, they scored. The Lakers scored 38 points and shot 75% from the field. So on the flip side, the Nuggets can't do that either. Right. They have to keep their foot on the gas because they haven't been a great defensive team all year long. But there were some plays last night where I showed that they're bought into to winning and, and they want to contend and they want to win a championship this year. I don't think I've ever seen Michael Porter on the floor like I did at the end of the game. <laughs> he was diving on the floor he was getting in passing lanes he was really he blocked two jump shots last night <laughs> Jokic again was giving more effort and energy on that defensive end than I've ever seen him do Brown Pope these guys so it seems like they're locked in and making a collective effort to at least try to defend because we know what we're going to get with their offense they are so good they are so unselfish they play the right way if they're doing both as you can see they're a scary scary team Lakers had an incredible second half offensively. They shot the ball really well. The problem was the Nuggets did too until mm. they really locked up in, in the fourth quarter. Uh, it, it's crazy. They only lost by six points this game. They looked like it was over in the middle of the third quarter. Yep. And if you remember that, Jokic's three that got a quite the reaction out of AD. And Jamal Murray hit a wild three in the fourth quarter at the end of the shot clock as well. That's six points. That's how you lose games. And sometimes it's that simple. It's like, yo, we couldn't stop them earlier and it's a wrap. But 
If you're the Lakers, yeah, you feel good. I see people saying it was like a win for the Lakers and a loss for the, no, it was, it was, a, it was a loss for the Lakers. Yeah. They lost the game one. It, the, what are we talking about? But yeah, they feel like they can compete with this team. They feel like they can beat this team. But they have to win game two. And I will say, there was big, mm. there was big, like Jeff Green, they cut it to nine. Jeff Green hit the, th hit the, the, corner, the corner three. Uh, they cut it to three or six points, and Pope hit a big three. So they had their chances. They just needed one or two more stops, and they were right in this game. Austin Reeves hit two big threes to cut it to three. So yeah. they're, they, they made plays, and they put themselves in the situation to win this game. But, again, it's hard to sustain that kind of deficit. Yeah. Uh, Austin been, hits the big right. three to cut it to three. Then he has another three, maybe two possessions later, to tie it and misses right. that one. Yeah. yeah, that goes down. It's a different ball yeah. game. And we still haven't talked much about AD, but the fact, the type of game that he's had, it's yeah. going to be super encouraging moving forward because he had a great game to close out the series versus the Warriors, but last night he even had a 40-piece. I think him being active, him being activated to be able to go in and continue to be assertive is going to be huge for the Lakers in the end, especially when the rest of their team shows up and starts making shots. A lot has been made, obviously, over the course of many, many years about playing in Denver and the altitude and all that. And people are going to focus on stamina and, and specifically LeBron at 38. Do you think there's anything there? I mean, it's for sure something there. I mean, of course, I feel like what happened at halftime is the second win kicked in. And, uh, you know, <laughs> we spoke on before, he's going to have to only get a day in between games to get a rest. So he's going to have to be ready. Use, you know, a little bit of that million and a half on his body that he spends on budget each year to, you know, get him ready and get him, get him, get him going <laughs> yeah. for, for, for game two because they got to win this one. And also, game two, I need more from Schroeder. I need more from D'Angelo mm. Russell. He, they cannot get outplayed yeah. so badly by Bruce Brown and Cobo Pope. Bruce Brown? That, like, can we just for a minute? Man, he's That was going. fun. He's D'Lo did, <laughs> got... did the whole, I'm going to shoot after the game. I'm wearing my uni. I'm still shooting. You guys ever did this? Does this matter? No, I never did it. But, like, I've seen tons of people that, that have done it, and I didn't care about it. And we still focus on it. So, like, let's not rag on yeah. D'Lo. You know what I mean? He didn't, we, he didn't throw a ladder down on a guy. No, so. of course. And, like, the shoot, like, <laughs> how you going to work on free, like, with Giannis? He was working on free throws post game. He yeah. shot 25 during the game. Yeah. But, you know what I mean? You don't like, like that? got a lot of work early. You don't like that? <laughs> Do we not like I that? mean, look, it shows, he, it shows he cares, I guess. Yeah. It shows he wants to be better. But, yeah, make him, we need him to make him in the game. It's, is is, is there a game. practice gym in that, in that arena? <laughs> yeah. Like, they yeah. shouldn't go to that one? I don't I mean, look, Russell Wilson was in the crowd, and he's notoriously cheesy about doing stuff like that and working out on the team plane it's and stuff. Contagious. So I feel like, you know, it's contagious. It was in the yeah. air. Big, um, that's all big part Nuggets of it. fan, Russell Wilson. Oh, sure. huge. <laughs> Lifetime. Lifetime. Um, guys, you ready? Good night for you. Time to shift <laughs> to the draft lottery. Oh, the greatest night in NBA history last night. Uh, Spurs winning it all. Woohoo! It's not just any draft lottery, by the way. It's the holy grail, the powerball of draft lotteries. Victor Wembanyama is going to San Antonio. I'm just, there mm. it is. There, sorry, Shams. To carry the torch from Tim Duncan and David Robinson. Um, there's been already a lot of, I mean, look at, look at my hometown. This is just to watch a ping pong ball get picked. What is I that? Love what that is that? A Buffalo Wild Wings? Championship. <laughs> Goofy. Goofy. Race for Sace, baby. Uh, you're so stupid. <laughs> Shout out, Buffalo Wild Wings. Uh, best landing spot for women, Yama. This is now going to be the question that we ask. Was this it? I, I think so, for sure. And again, he's not going to a good team, but he's going hey, to hey. a good organization. And <laughs> there's, Potentially there's, good. <laughs> there's nobody better for him to learn from than Pop. And you know Timmy's going to come around. You know David Robinson's going to come, come around. He's going to have these legendary big that he can learn from. He already has the familiarity with all the French guys, with Boris and Tony Parker owning his team in France. So, <laughs> again, this is the stars are aligned. He said this is where he wanted. This is where the whole country of France wanted him to go. No pressure. So this worked out, and it just shows, I mean, the Spurs are very, very good at tanking because when they do it, they hey, get a generational seven-foot guy. So. We're clearly all saints because the karma was in the mm. air. And the, oh, hey. yes! By the way, what you don't <laughs> see are my tears and sweat that were all part of the... Uh, I never thought watching... Mark Tatum open up envelopes was going to be so stressful. I'll say, too, I was more hyped to watch this lottery show <laughs> than the actual game coming afterwards. Like, I was standing up for me it. Too. Like, I was getting drafted. Like, it was insane. I, and by the way, sorry to anyone around me in the hotel because I did scream very loudly when it finally happened. It was, I, I can't believe it affected me like it did because I didn't think there was a chance. I mean, it's been a long time since we had our last championship. So, yes, we've been suffering. Yeah, baby, Sean Elliott was already oh, ready to go. Oh. <laughs> Everybody's so happy. Um, we're already planning ahead. Evan, what'd you think? Would, would, uh, I mean, I'm, did you roll your eyes? Were you like, enough? And I was like, uh, of course. I was more <laughs> upset because 
They never gave my boy MJ a number one pick. You know what I mean? He always gets a second pick. He's had enough. This could have could have <laughs> helped, but no, this is huge. I think it's going to be good for the game of basketball. Obviously, the Spurs is a great organization for Victor. The history, like what Chandler said, I think he's going to do great. I think he's going to develop well. And um, man, number what number six is yeah, coming. Yeah, race for Sace, race ladies for and Sace. gentlemen. Get ready for the hashtag. By the way, also shout out Dallas. You lucky SOBs. Mm. Uh, Shams was there. Tell us about it. What was it like in the room? So, Michelle, that bar scene that we just saw, I'm just figuring, trying to figure out, how did you make it back to L.A.? Well? I know you were somewhere Chandler's in there. PJ. You yeah. get it in. <laughs> Good friend here. It was, it was the most surreal, probably, lottery to be a part of, just because everyone knew the stakes. I, w I went to the Zion Williamson lottery as well, but there was, you could tell there was something more unique this year, especially with the teams involved. The Spurs weren't uh, really in the mix for Zion uh, that year, but I think... Um, this was massive. And when Peter Holt, when, when they got the number one pick, he literally got up. This is probably my most favorite part of the draft lottery. He got up. I don't know if they showed it on TV, but he got up and he was fist pumping. He kept saying, let's go, let's go, let's go, let's go. And afterward, uh, I think the, the question around Peter Holt was, did he curse? Uh, did, he, did he swear on national TV? So. Uh, he didn't. But yeah. Peter, Peter Holt, R.C. Buford, their GM, Brian Wright, uh, they were elated. But he kept saying, let's go over and over and over again. You could hear it throughout the ballroom. He was pumped up. And this is massive for the Spurs organization. Um, they've been doing a lot of research. They've been embedded um, abroad, doing their research on all the Euro uh, European players, abroad players, like they always do. But especially with Victor Wembanyama, trying to make sure they research everything, uh, leave no st stone unturned. And this is a guy that's going to be coming in with lofty, lofty expectations. <laughs> Uh, one of the best prospects ever in NBA history, and I think for for the Spurs, this is just massive. And so, Michelle, I know, I know, you, if you were saying "Let's go" in your in your place in your home, um, you definitely had some cuss words to it. Heck yeah, you do. <laughs> Shout out to the Spurs for doing their due diligence and their research. They could have just asked me. That's the number one pick right there, buddy. That's the one you want. I, look, I'm excited for them. I'm excited for Pop. Because yeah. a lot of people are wondering what's next in his career. When is he finished? Ding, ding. I personally thought, yo, he just wanted to win the gold medal. He's going to sail off into the sunset. And now he has like a project for the next <laughs> decade to be a part of, to build up his, his new Timmy, his new Tony, his new whoever it is. Uh, I just want to see him play. That Dang. summer league game when they play, if the Spurs mm. play him, I wouldn't. I would keep him out of everything oh. until... Until it's time to play real games. I'm but with you. That's going to be a movie out there, and yep. I can't wait to see it. That's, uh, yeah, Where that's all. By the way, what? What, do they even bring in Scoot or Brandon Miller for a workout? Or do they, you? Do they have no workouts? No, no. We're not I mean, talking to nobody. We're not even working him out. <laughs> <laughs> we're not, Straight up. Like, he's good. <laughs> good we're, bro. We're, we're good to go. By the way, this is the quickest way to find out you're a hypocrite, which is what I found out last night. This entire time, I've been like, this is too much pressure on a kid. I don't think we should build it up. The, the minute that envelope got open, I was like, <laughs> we want it yeah, all! For sure. <laughs> because so it's like, I'm a hypocrite, and there's a lot of pressure on this, this teenage uh, person. But, man, it was fun to watch. He had a disposable camera last night with his family out in France at 2 o'clock in the morning. I loved it. It wasn't the only <laughs> thing that happened last night. There were other teams there trying to do great things. We know how the Pistons have been tanking. Mm. They showed Ben Wallace because he was the representative. He looked so awesome. I thought, uh-oh. And then they get the number five. Do you think this does anything to maybe decentivize tanking at all? I mean... I would think so. For the Pistons situation, they oh. need as many assets as they can possibly get. So an asset, for that particular situation, I don't. I think they're going to do it regardless. But <laughs> to, to only win 17 games and get the Man. fifth pick. But I they, mean, I don't even know if they were tanking. They just weren't good. They, just, uh, <laughs> they, they, they couldn't. They, they could not win this year with that roster. So there's a difference yeah. in a good team resting their guys and tanking. Or the Detroit Pistons. I mean, they didn't play K towards bad. the end of the year. Yeah, they, they were in the – they had the recipe to, to fail this year. So I wouldn't even consider them tanking. They just – they knew they were going to lose. There are certain teams like Dallas, like Toronto, that kind of ended up tanking towards the <laughs> end of the year that were actually good at basketball yeah. and like could make a run in the playoffs – that, that didn't work out, but yeah. Winning, that was seven, tough. winning 17 games and getting the fifth pick, you go from maybe getting Victor to one of the Thompson twins is a dramatic drop off, but yeah. 
yeah. It's, Poor kids. Yeah, it's Don't tough. Don't say that. Um, One at a time at some point. There you go. I just did the lottery simulator eight times in a row. Wow. <laughs> Didn't the Blazers miss it by like one one ball or something it said last night too? Like they missed the number one pick by one number. Is that what it was? Yes. Yeah, they ain't would have liked that. They don't know what to do. <laughs> with fine, you work with. Fine with they that. don't know what to do number one picks out there. Though. Shams, here's a question for you, Shams. What pick in the lottery do the Spurs get next year is what we're all wondering. <laughs> <laughs> we're not all wondering that, Shams. <laughs> Women Yama said last night he's trying to win a chip. I ASAP, heard that. So I, I heard that. I don't. I don't. I don't know if he's really focused on trying to get, I, get in right? the lottery. But I, I think you know being there last night, th there was a palpable sense of like optimism with teams like the Spurs and and even to an extent Charlotte. They moved up a little bit, but you could just tell around Detroit and around the teams that slipped out of the top three, especially being Detroit. I mean Houston for sure also slipped a little bit as well. But Detroit was top two, top three odds. They slipped all the way to five. I, mean, I don't know if that's ever happened before. Um, but definitely, that there's heartbreak there when you mm. don't get a chance to draft Victor Wembanyama or even the number two pick. And there was a lot of chatter this week. I'm here at the Combine. There's a lot of chatter around executives that if the Pistons had gotten number one, they were going to go all in uh, aggressively with all their resources to, to go hire Monty Williams. Ooh. And at that point, with the number one pick, that would have been an extremely appealing job for Monty Williams. Alas, they end up with number five. Still a, a talented roster, I think. Uh, Troy Weaver's done a good job, but mm -hmm. there's, there's heartbreak involved when you go from number one or number two to number five <laughs> in, in, in any lottery. Wait, so they're basically saying since we don't have the number one pick, we're not even gonna bother embarrassing ourselves by asking Monty to come coach this team? <laughs> Is that what they're saying? I'm, I'm saying that when you get the number one pick in this draft, it changes a lot. It changes which coaches might have interest. Man. It changes the value. In some instances, I think it could have changed valuations of teams. Like, imagine if Charlotte got the number one pick and you're Ooh. Michael Jordan trying to sell your team. I mean, how, do you ask for more? How much more money do you ask for? 400 million? 500 million? I think that was definitely a question that team executives, league executives have been asking. All yeah, week. there was a lot of valuation uh, comments last night about what having Victor Wimanyama does to a, a franchise. Um, look, the Blazers, I think, were one of the the lucky ones last night as well. They did get that three. <laughs> <laughs> run, Pop, run. Um, he might have been running like that in retirement. I, 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 <laughs> it's like, no, now it's like it's, it's starting all over again. I love it so much. Um, do you think Dame stays in Portland now? Does this do anything for that? I think this might be go the other way. Like, yo, we have really? we get Scoot, we get Scoot Henderson. Now we can shop Dame. Now we can get something for Dame. We can we can re up with Amp Simons with Scoot. Or Brandon Miller with Shade and Sharp, your guy, and 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 build to the future now, and it might incentivize them to do that. Had they got number one, it's a little different. I think I'm number two even, but number three, like they're almost not getting to pick the guy, and and but it does set them up in a good place to build mm. their future. Man. I'm of the belief that he's out this summer. I don't know if he's gonna have to ask out. I don't know if he has his desired places. I see Evan over there smiling. He might know a little better than me. Go on. But no, if no, I no. was running the team, I'd probably be a terrible GM because I'd be like, yo, this is the time to kick Dane to the curve. We got Scoot Henderson there. Or but, you'd be and, a great and, GM. And also, as good as Victor is and as good as he's going to be, there's a good chance that Scoot is better right away. Yeah. Right? Yeah, there's no, a really I, good I, chance I like, that like Brandon Miller lot, be is better. Like, yeah, I think sure. he's got better odds to be Rookie of the Year than Victor because this is a project. He's going to, you look at his body, his frame, this is going to take time. I don't think he's going to be fantastic right away. We'll get him some enchiladas, some tacos, yeah, we're gonna fatten exactly. him up. It's going to be good. Water burger. Yeah, water. Well, oh, water burger for <laughs> days. I think, I think <laughs> having Pop as his coach even makes that slow even play. more sure. Like, yeah. he's going to play that slow. He's going to yes. get him right. He's yeah. done this before. This is not Tim Duncan coming out of four years at Wake Forest right. ready to play in the finals immediately. Pop knows what he's looking at. He's going to take his time. He's going to get it right. And so, yeah, I'm with you. I think, you know, Brandon Miller, Scoot Henderson, those are definitely the favorites for the for the Rookie of the Year next year. And Chet. And so mm. it's like, let's uh, get it going. And Chet. Well, Chet. he's had a whole year to no, bulk no, absolutely. up. absolutely. I, I totally dig you, but when you look at what Scoot Henderson is doing, I love Scoot. If, he's a if man. They were, yeah, if they were to take him number one, I mean, you can't do that, of course, <laughs> but physically, he, he's so gifted. But we get back to the Blazers situation. I like what they can do if they still keep Dame Lillard. We forget how, you know, how great of a player Dame Lillard is and what he's able to do with, with you know, the, hmm. the teams he had in the past. And if you use this third pick and some of the assets they already have, maybe you do get one or two good players in return. And, you know, with Dame Lillard, he feels as though he can win a championship in Portland with the right pieces. So I don't think there's anything around that camp saying trade Dane much more than being like, yo, how can we 
load them up with a team and assets. I'll Chan be interested. Chandler does not forget how good Dame was. I do not. Yeah. <laughs> I wake up <laughs> It's like I think about it every night before I go to bed. <laughs> um, by the way, the Mavs. Whew, there were New York Knicks fans all around just, come on, please, please. And then they, it didn't happen. So it was worth it, right? The tank was I worth mean, it. I mean, it was definitely worth it. But again, I think the system is kind of, it's, it, it's, it's, Fraud, right? Like yeah. a lot of teams, a lot of teams have not ever had the number one pick, and it just basically makes building a great team like lucky. Like yeah. you know what I mean? So like I think there's definitely some holes in the system, but yeah, the fact that Mark did this and it, it worked, it worked out. It was probably worth the fine, right? But it's funny. I was talking to someone in Dallas, and you can say nothing and be quiet, and you're good, or you can tell the <laughs> truth and you get fined. So it's 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 a it's a fine line of what's right, what's wrong. That's but America. in this case, that's a life lesson right there. <laughs> yeah, keep your mouth. Keep your mouth closed and you're fine. But yeah, this worked out for him and now they get to a top 10 pick and the, instead of losing it to New York. I can't believe that worked out for them. I mean, I can, but I can't. Like, it was very, very lucky. Um, there was other news yesterday, not great news. Got, guy lost his job. Doc Rivers fired by Philadelphia. Um, Shams, look, look, this happens every season, I feel like, with Doc, but it finally did happen, Shams. Was anyone surprised? No, I mean, any anytime that you finish the way that they finish it, lose a 3-2 lead. Uh, we know the numbers on Doc Rivers losing leads, but at the end of the day, Joel Embiid, James Harden in Game 6 and Game 7, uh, they just did not look in sync enough offensively. Those two guys just needed one good game together to close out Boston. They couldn't come up with it. Um, I spoke about it on Monday, just the lack of them figuring out their offense and their offensive schemes. Uh, they, they did not have that pick and roll with James Harden and Joel Embiid available. The Boston essentially let them uh, pass the corners, uh, test their shooters, and they got rid of their best threat, which was that pick and roll, that uh, arguably the best pick and roll in the league. And so finding a new coach that can get the most out of both of those guys, I think will be a high priority. They're going to look at all the normal names, the, the high level names, Mike Budenholzer, Nick Nurse, Monty Williams, Mike D'Antoni. That's an interesting name. He has oh. a lot of history with James Harden, PJ Tucker, Daryl Morey. Uh, but I believe this will be a process that will take time. I don't think they're going to rush to something. I think this is going to be an extensive process. And they're going to have to work internally with their with their guys, with their players, with, with their staff for an office to make sure that they get this hire right. Somewhere Mike D'Antoni's like, er? I don't know. What? I don't know. <laughs> yeah, what? <laughs> what is that about? Right, you want another order of offense? <laughs> right, I mean, offense? good Lord. But look, this is always the question when a, a coach and a coach with a resume gets fired. Was it the reason they lost to the Celtics? Uh, or was he? No, was he the reason that James played bad? No, was he the reason that James played good and had 40 plus points in those two games? No, was he the reason Joel Embiid was the MVP? No, and it, it is, <laughs> I understand the history in the past of Doc Rivers and blowing these, you know, these leads that he has and losing game sevens, but at the end of the day, coaches, that are game managers. They need to know how to run a team. They know how to run substitutions and add timeouts. They need to run an offense. But at the end of the day, players are going to play. And the number one thing that I learned in my career is they have to be a player's coach. It's a player's league. You have to get along. You have to be likable. And hmm. from guys that I play with him, I've never played for Doc. I have a great relationship with him. But guys that play with him, I think it's a little different. And there's some trust issues there. And so there's some personality traits that don't sit well with players. But to put this all on him after the season they had, I don't think that's fair, but it, I tweeted yesterday the coaching is just a cesspool, right? Like, let, let's, <laughs> yeah. let's fire this guy yeah, and let's right, go hire right. someone else that someone else just fired for doing the same thing we fired this guy for. Like, how? It's it, like love. It, it, it pisses me just off. Just pick honestly. it up scraps. And that's why I will never be on that end of it. I like this side where we can sit here, <laughs> dissect, and point our fingers because it's such a player's league and it's really, really unfair. Coaches get tough what? things. <laughs> that is, yes. Just yeah, that's, that's literally what they do. I mean... It, you can't blame it all on him, but somebody has to go. It's not Joel Embiid. Yeah. It's not Tyrese Maxey. It might be James Harden, but <laughs> uh, it, 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 you, know, you have to make changes. I think, I always think, look, they had Doc there. Then they hired Dale Morey as the president mm. of basketball. You hire a president of basketball, they're always going to want to have their coach, have their vision of the team. He started instilling his vision a little bit. James Harden made a big trade for him. P.J. Tucker. He's had some shooters. He even went and got Daniel House, his old friend. He's going to want his coach. And you always you always figured that. Now, who his coach is, that's, I, I get why people are saying Mike D'Antoni. But it, all the candidates are the guys who just got fired. They just yeah. fired Nick Nurse, who won a title. They, yeah. they just fired Monty Williams, who, who went to the, went to the uh, finals. And it's like, oh, we want the guy that got fired from the other team, and maybe he can do better with our guys. And it, it just goes to say, 
they're not really doing all that bad jobs. They're just losing, I guess. Yeah. Don't and you need we a fresh end up with start? This. Yeah, you just you need something else, maybe. But now, what do you think about Harden? Does he stay now, or does he go, or did this matter? I, I don't think you should go back to Houston. We talked about it yesterday. <laughs> go somewhere where it's worth your time, your your last three or four years of your career. But I think the number one thing he has to do is just accept accountability. We always speak on this game. This kryptonite is game seven. Yes. So we leave every season. Ben Simmons left the season blaming Doc for how it turned out. Mm -hmm. You know, certain years, other players have done that as well. But I think when it comes down to it, the players have to be accountable and just win the game. Doc is putting you in position and giving you freedom to do anything you want and everything you want. So when it doesn't go your way, just say, yo, I messed up and call it a day. And I say, only J James and I can't win with just us or we need five <laughs> players out there. Like, no, you, you all make all the money, you get all the headlines, all the trophies. Now get all the blame for it. I mean, you, or you just you need to avoid game sevens if you have to. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's another that's that's right? thing. Yeah, yeah. Get it over with yeah, before for that. Sure. Um, our expectations for head coaches, and I know it fluctuates from team to team and when, but do we think they're too high? I mean, again, like we just talked about, it's, it doesn't all fall on them because they don't get the praise when, when you know, their guys are all stars or their guys do advance. And again, they were one game away from going to the Eastern Conference Finals and having a, a really good matchup against uh, against the Miami Heat. So. I think it's more with the history of, of Doc and, and what he hasn't been able to do in these closeout games in the playoffs. But, uh, again, this, this all doesn't fall on him. I think a lot of times teams just do this for a, a breath of fresh air, to mix it up, to change it up, and think that they could kind of get the best out of uh, the guys that the first guy didn't. But it's an, un, it's an unruly, unfair business, which I never hoped to be in. Do you know if you're a coach, you work every day, like 20 hours oh, a day. Oh, heavens. So why do you keep saying that's the reason you don't want yeah, to Yeah, it's true. <laughs> you have the schedule of an NBA player, but the salary of an NBA coach. Yeah. I'm out. Good yeah. Lord. Uh, Shams, great job. I'm, I'm jealous you were in the room last night. It, this is our Friday, so we will see you on Monday, bright and early. I thought of you, Thank Michelle. You. Thank, well, that <laughs> makes me you. Oh, alert. Uh, we're, we're taking a quick Riz break. When we come back for basketball tonight. We will preview the Eastern Conference Finals. Oh, well, that's a prediction. Run it back, yeah, yeah. Run it up, run it back, run it up, run it back. The NBA Eastern Conference Finals tip off tonight as the Miami Heat face off against the Boston Celtics. But why just watch when you can earn a share of 10,000 bucks in cash prizes when you enter the DoorDash Conference Finals Challenge on FanDuel? All you have to do is draft your best lineup of five players ahead of the matchup while staying under the salary cap. Fans with the highest scoring lineups will win their share of cash prizes. Enter for free on FanDuel.com today. Another game tonight, Eastern Conference Finals getting underway. Uh, any chance, a legit chance, that this Miami Heat team can pull this thing off, Chandler? Yeah, I'm not yes. sleeping on the Heat. I think there's a chance. I don't think they're the favorites, but uh, listen, everything they've been through this season, the ups and downs, the play-in tournament, everything they've overcome with the injuries of Tyler Hero and Victor Oladipo, they're right there. And Jimmy Butler is a bona fide star. He's been one of the best players in the playoffs. but. I look forward to that, too. Bam out of bio. He's got to be big. He's got to be aggressive. Look at the Boston Celtics. I'm Horford, Robert Williams. They really don't have anybody to handle him. So I'd love to see him come out of the gates early. Mm -hmm. You know what you're going to get from Jimmy. You know the two wings on the other side on Boston are going to have great games and explode for a lot of points. But I would love to see Bam kind of control the paint, be versatile, and, and, and do his thing because they really don't have anybody for him. Yeah, no, I think it's I think it's doable, but they're going to have to play damn near perfect. Jimmy's going to have to be electric. I think Bam's going to have to show up, and the others are going to really have to chip in. Matt Struess is going to have to hit his shots. When Duncan Robinson get in, he's going to have to make plays, and, along with Caleb Martin. And then they're going, going to have to do their job on the other end defensively because you see Tatum averaging 28 a night. Jalen Brown's coming in, getting a 25 plus and then every now and then you got Marcus Smart hitting some shots and mm. it's a loaded team to go after so it's going to be a full 48 minutes and I think you know if they duke it out you know Heat they're cultured they always have a chance. <laughs> heat culture. Boston has the most talent left in the playoffs I yes. believe. They have the most explosive offense even with Jokic doing the things he's doing over there on the right night these guys hit 20 25 threes can't beat that. Yeah. Uh, I think the Heat got to fight fire or fire. They need Kevin Love to shoot better than 20% from three in the 15 minutes he's playing. They need Max Struess to light it up. They need Duncan Robinson. I'm wondering how late in this series we can start talking about Tyler Hero coming back. Initially, yeah. they said the finals. Oh. Now they're saying maybe late Eastern Conference finals. He's in a soft cast. People are getting excited. Nah, they need that extra gun. They need that against this team. Is it doable? 
Yes, but they're rightfully the underdogs for yeah, sure. Coming back for Marcus Smart off six weeks of, mm. of rest, that's... Not good. Yeah, right. You might have to win sanity. Right. Just the sit out. <laughs> I'm going to sit out, just sit out. Bam, bam, come scream. I need him off me. Hit, okay. hit him hard. Come get him, big fella. Are we worried, though, at all, this Celtics team and, and the pressure of being the favorites? I don't... After talking to the young kid, I think he's ready. I think he'll be prepared. I think, you know, last year they're still hungry. They, they uh, have a bad taste in their mouth from giving mm. up a 2-1 lead. I think they thought, like, after getting there, where, you know, the expectations are realistic. So it's a familiar foe, and they comprehend that they're up, and, you know, Tyler Hero's not playing, and they have all their players right now, the Celtics, and I think they're going to try to go in and close this out within five. Yeah, I mean, and they were just battle-tested against Philly, right? And they had their back against the wall, but this team is poised to win a championship. They're great offensively. They're great defensively. They're deep. They have vet guys that have been here before. Uh, I don't see this series going very long, but again, I've been sleeping on the heat all year long and Jimmy <laughs> Butler, and, and they're doing some special things, so I don't know. Who knows? Hey, yeah, buddy, on that graphic right there, losing the finals last year did something to him, so <laughs> they're going to be ready. Yeah, yeah, they're going to be ready, and, and 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 I think they know if they handle business here, there's a long series happening on the other end right there. You get a nice week of rest uh, yeah. before the finals start, June 1st, I believe. Mm -hmm. Let's lock it in. Let's get it done. I think they're going to be focused. I don't know, this Heat team, I, I'm, I think I'm a believer. Something happened, it's weird. You got the Heat winning this year? I mean, I, I just don't feel like this is as sure a thing as maybe some do, or as those numbers would tell you, but yeah, it's, <laughs> it feels like it'll be closer than it is. Guys, break time. When we return, 2012 NBA back, champion, Steven Jackson is here. Back, We've got questions for Jax, it's gonna be good. We are back. 2003 champion. I'm fired. Steven Jackson in studio today. Co host of the All the Smoke podcast, of course, with Matt Barnes, a ginormous podcast to say the very least. Oh my goodness, buddy. I know you love mornings. Um, so do we, <laughs> as you can tell. Okay, I know we're going to get to the, the draft lottery last night because it's a big moment, but I know there was a lot made we're of. because we're Spurs people. Well, you are now because you mended. I mean, you're good. Yeah, we're good. Right? Now. Well, we're how good. did that? How did that all happen with well, us? Well, not, we're good. well, nothing actually. We haven't had any conversations. It's just you know, <laughs> times pass, things happen. You know, I, I forgive them. They did give me an opportunity to win the championship. Yeah. But you know, I had to let them know what they did. You know what I mean? A lot of people <laughs> didn't understand how my my career ended with San Antonio. Right. So I had to tell those stories. Let me ask you this though. Um, in the same in the interview you did with Dejounte Murray, you did reference uh, women in San Antonio being meh. You want to yeah. talk about that with me? Yeah, uh, <laughs> I, I live there, and you know, <laughs> one thing about me, I, about I like me. my women a fry away from being fat, <laughs> right? God. I do. I like my women with some meat on them, right? So <laughs> in San Antonio, it was just perfect for me. You know, the, the, all the women that like to eat, it's one of the leading uh, cities in obesity in Texas. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, it's just the truth. It's just the truth. But, uh, you know, it, it, it worked for me because I'm from Texas, so I was used to it. I know. We could, we're could. we allowed to say it, guys, not y'all. We would not be fighting <laughs> over the like same women. <laughs> <laughs> not at all. We would not be arguing over that. I'm a country boy. I'm a country boy. Uh, but obviously, we know all the expectations. <laughs> with Victor going number one, most likely going to the Spurs. What can he expect, you know, playing in that system, that city for Pop, everything that comes with it? I think the biggest thing for him that he's going to be in a system where everything is professional. It's a championship organization they used to winning. They do everything by the book. Um, they're going to have everything he needs for him to be successful and be the best player he needs to be. I think it's the best situation for any young kid coming into the NBA is going to that family oriented, family oriented San Antonio Spurs organization where you're going to get the best out of everything there. Look, I'm going I'm to pivot a little bit. We don't talk about the Spurs all day. Uh, John Moran, <laughs> this yes. is a, something you've been outspoken about. And mm -hmm. I know people say a lot of times, yo, vets in the locker room, it would help. And stuff isn't happening in the locker room. But hmm. if you were his vet, if you, like, what would your advice be to him in this situation? You've had your own situation. You just mm -hmm. spoke about it as well. Like, what's going on? Like, what do you tell somebody, like, going through this? Well, you know, at the same time, you can have vets, but you have to want to do right for you by yourself first, right? So when I made mistakes, you know, I did have vets to tell me like, okay, look, one more, one more incident and it's over. Guys like Reggie Miller, guys like Steve Smith. So I was able to make some drastic changes in my life to be where I'm at today hmm. because I cared about the people around me. I didn't want to be selfish and do, uh, make decisions that I hurt people that I take care of. You know, I care about people around me. So I wanted to be um, 
continue to be the protector and provider that I was raised to be. So he has to make that decision on and, and, and sit down and look in the mirror like, okay, I'm being selfish to do these things is the second time. It, it, it doesn't show maturity at all to do something so stupid again where, you know, and then it's self-inflicted. It's, it's not nothing that somebody's doing or, 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 or baiting him in to do it. He's doing it on his own. So I think it's nothing that a veteran or anything can do at this, at this point. He has to look in the mirror and understand what, what's at jeopardy, and he has to make these decisions. His dad can't tell him anything. His mom can't tell him anything. This is huh. all on him. The second time, I think the, everything that's happening, the blame, the trouble he's going to get in suspension, all that needs to sit in his lap. And he needs to deal with this time to understand what's at stake because last time, the little slap on the hand, the fake uh, meetings he had with people, none of that, I knew none of that worked <laughs> because they tried to make me meet with people. You know what I'm saying? When we got in the brawl. Yeah, you know what yeah, I'm saying? Yeah. That, that, didn't, that didn't do any justice for me. So he has, he has, to, he has to own up to this and, 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 and sit down and look in the mirror and understand that, okay, I made this mistake. Now I have to deal with it. Whether it's suspension, whether it's missing it all year, he got to deal with it. Nobody can help him this time. Wait, what do you think the league should do suspension-wise? How much? Well, I'm not, I'm, I've been a guy who lost $3 million for one punch. Yep. So I, I'm not, I really don't want to get, get, get into that side. It was a hell of a punch. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I, I, but I was helping somebody. I was actually helping the teammate, too. You know what I'm saying? I was actually helping my teammate. Y'all were going Team 12 player. on 18,000. Yeah. You had to. You were outnumbered. <laughs> but the suspension, whatever it is, uh, Michelle, whatever it is, I just think that um, it needs to be something that is going to make him realize what he has at stake because yeah. eight games didn't do it, mm -mm. you know, talking to people didn't do it. It has to be a mm -hmm. point where, because for me, when I got suspended 30 games and the game was taken away from me, I really had to sit down like, right. mm -hmm. and that's what, that's what really hurts. Money, the friends, all that. Take the game away from him mm -hmm. and see what happens. <laughs> Yeah, I, honestly, it's, it's sad to me that this kid has it all, right? He's got $230 million guaranteed. He's so talented. He's one of the most successful, <laughs> fun-to-watch players in the league. And there's a small window for you to maximize that and to see him do it the first time and now do the same thing again. Like you said, it was self-inflicted. It's not like TMZ got him, right? right. So this yeah. is just, this is immature. It's ignorant. It shows his apology. It really didn't mean much because he just went, he's, he surrounds himself with horrible people. And I hope he gets better. And I hope, because, I mean, he's he's great for the league, right? He right. is so talented. He is fun to watch. But, man, you, you can't, you're a role model. So many yeah. kids are watching. You can't put this message out there, right? I have a nephew, yeah. bro. I don't mean to cut you off, but I have a nephew. So my, my brother passed at the end of last year, my little brother. And he's a big John Moret fan, right? He wears his hair like him, hmm. dresses like him, everything. I reached out to Ja and told him my brother, my little my nephew really wants to meet you. My, he's going through a tough time, just lost his dad. And he reached out. So he's a good kid. Yeah. Yeah. You know, so he's a good kid. I just think that a lot of times when kids from our area fall into money, we turn, we want to be gangster. We think that money makes us gangster. And that's totally the opposite. You know, I, I, I come from it and I made it, a point for me to try to get away from it because I know how hard it was being in that life. And a lot of times when you see kids do that, they're trying to be something they're not because the guys that really carried guns growing up, they try, they, they, they were try, trying to get out that life. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So for him to do that, it shows that he's, he's, he, he's influenced by the wrong type of people, by the wrong type of music, and he should be the one influencing others instead of being influenced by nonsense. Yep. No, I mean, y'all said it all. I definitely agree. Uh, I think everything with a pro athlete in a position you're in, it's just the accountability and the direction that you want to go. And with Ja, I think, you know, one thing that's occurring is he's going from being, you know, the young, cute puppy kid that everybody <laughs> loved to, you know, now being a man and, you know, comprehending that he has to take over the organization and franchise and the whole league mm -hmm. to really set the tone and, and slow everything down and be like, yo, this is how we're going to do things now. When he says a quote, Everybody says it. When he does a dance, everybody does it. Mm -hmm. So I think he has to be cognizant of that at all times and be like, yo, I just got to at least do all my dumb stuff inside the crib with no phones. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Right. And, and make yeah. and elevate to a businessman and, 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 and an icon like he really is. The first time this happened, there was a lot more favor for him around the league. A lot of guys were saying, hey, I get it. I, you know, <laughs> this and that. This time, it's a lot, more, a lot more of like, hey, mm -hmm. fool me once. Right. You know what I mean? But I'm talking to players around the league like, yo, he's... You said it earlier, he's a provider, he has too much responsibility. He has Nike, he has the NBA, he has, yeah. his power at, he has mm. all these situations that are built on him, including his family and all that stuff. Now everybody's like, all right, dog, like what, what are we doing now? Mm -hmm. And he's gonna have to he's gonna have to live with that, like you said. And if they take away the game from him, they take away all that, he's gonna have to look with within. And I think, you know, we might finally be at that point, hopefully. Yeah. And uh, just to change pace, obviously, uh, 
I got a question for you. If you were James Harden, where would you be hooping at next year? Oh, <laughs> what a sidestep there. You stay in Phillies, stop by the Lilas, or would you go down to, mm, back to Texas where, mm, where they're a little bit thicker, like you said? Well, they, you know, one thing, one thing about Houston, they love James in Houston. Yeah. Oh, yeah. They love him in Houston. But, don't, but, but if you're him, don't you go and just retire there in yeah, four or five years? Why there? would you go to this? and? Because it ain't the same. But you ain't winning. You're not, you're not yeah. winning there. Triple, double, yeah. leave. After party, like the streets is waiting for it. Wow. He has a restaurant there, restaurant 13. I think for him, man, it depends on what he wants out the end of the rest of his career. Does he want to run his numbers up yeah. and have a good time and, 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 and build his legacy in Houston? Does he want to stay in Philly and with, with, with his uh, guys, um, Dan Phoney? And uh, if, 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 if he comes wow. and Daryl Morey and lose for the rest of his career, because that's what's going to happen. D'Antoni ain't won nothing. I don't know why they think about bringing him in and bringing them back together. What have they won together? <gasps> nothing. I don't know. I don't know why they even think bringing that up. D'Antoni's the only guy that keep getting jobs and ain't won nothing. I don't, that just hurts me to death, bro. But if he stay in Philly, it, it's going to really depend on what coach. Mm. It's going to really depend on what coach. Um, you know, they, they blamed everything on Doc, and Doc does have a bad track record of being a 3-1. I can't go against that. But if I was James, I would find a situation where I can be me but also win. And yeah. I, I think that's definitely not in Houston. It might be in Philly. Who knows where it is? But um, <laughs> not, not Houston. No. Nah, he, not he's not going to win it. Yeah, just retire there. Yeah. That's, that's it. Well, if you want to chill, it's cool. Yeah, yeah go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> Let's talk about you a little bit. The show sure. with Matt Bourne, All the Smoke, one of the <laughs> biggest podcasts in the world, one of the biggest Thanks. shows. Uh, at what point did you two come together and say, hey, let's do this? And when did you know that was the move for you? Uh, I think it was just a timing thing. I was doing Fox and ESPN at the time, and Matt was as well. <laughs> and um, a lot of the shows, you know, we were doing good and bringing a lot of attention to a lot of the shows. So we was like, man, we need to do our own show. And um, we were just sitting and smoking one day, and um, we were talking about the show. And <laughs> his, his sister said, say, y'all need to come up with a show, like all, name it All the Smoke. She came up with it. Uh, Matt had a great relationship with Ellen Reckerton. She's one of the creators of Red Table Talk. Mm -hmm. um, she brought us to Showtime with Brian Daly. We pitched the idea. Two weeks later, well, maybe a month later, we're doing a photo shoot for the show. And, you know, I, I just really, it's really to all our fans, man. I think for me and Matt, people love us because we wear our emotions on our sleeve. Everything we go through in life, we talk about it, we don't hide about it. And a lot of people that come on our show, um, they feel like they can do the same thing, say things they've been wanting to say and get stuff off their chest. So the reason for our success has been for the, our support from our fans, but a lot of our guests that come on and, and tell good stories and, you know, give, give us a lot of stuff that nobody knew about them. So it's been a blessing from Showtime, and uh, but shouts out to Matt for uh, bringing this together. Yeah, pull up, Matt. I know it's early. Yeah. yeah. Pull up, man. It's true. Yeah. He, he the boss, man. He, he do, hey, I, I don't mind getting up, because he's going to do all the hard stuff. He's going to do all the meetings. He's going to make sure the money, right, the contracts, That's right? That's smart. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. I like that. I do the dirty work. Yeah. There you go. I went on your show. I had a great time. <laughs> we had a great time. <laughs> we had a great time. <laughs> had a great time. <laughs> might still be hot. Uh, uh, you gave us the best. Kobe uh, story we've oh, had on all show. The best crazy. Kobe story. That was crazy. That was all facts, too. I was yeah. not gassing that. But I hope besides so. me, who were you most looking forward besides to chopping me. up on your show? Because you've had some crazy list of guests. My my, my favorite guests, uh, well, I have two. Will Smith and Jim Gray. Mm. Uh, Jim Gray has been like a mentor of mine for the last wow. five, six years. Wow. Uh, he talked about me in his book. Um, and he's somebody who I talk to a lot. Even with the boxing space now, um, I'm learning a lot from him. But Jim Gray has some of the best stories. He's been around so long. Uh, yeah. Muhammad Ali's first and last interview. Um, he got a lot of great stories of sports, man. And, uh, but uh, Will Smith's uh, first interview mm. was right after the Chris Rock. Oh, dear. Mm. Yeah, and, uh, and also it was uh, when he just dropped the Emancipation movie. It was an uh, excellent movie. Antoine Fuqua, it was a great movie. And um, just being able to talk to him. And uh, him announced, he announced on the show that he's producing my documentary with Westbrook. Oh, um, wow. Yeah, so that interview was just great to be able to meet him and to pick his brain. Jax, this has been a pleasure and an honor. <laughs> All the smoke. I don't even know. I don't need to promote it. It's one of the biggest podcasts out there. It's been great to see you. Great I know you're see. busy. It's been you're a while. off. It's been a while. It's been um, a while. We're gonna come back and wrap things up really, really, really quickly. Run we're back, gonna back for Run it up. See, I don't give up. Yeah, I know. Run it up. Run it up. Run it back. Run it up. Run it back. Yeah. Run it up. Run it back, run it up, run it back, run it up, run it back. Time for the NBA playoffs, and you can get in on the action right from tip off with FanDuel right now. All customers can get a no sweat same game parlay every weekend when you bet the NBA playoffs. That's right, place a three plus leg same game parlay or 
Same game parlay plus on any NBA playoff game, and you'll get bonus bets back if you don't win. There's no better place to bet all the playoff action than America's number one sports book. Download the app. Get a no-sweat same game parlay every weekend. The NBA playoffs. FanDuel, official sports betting partner of the NBA. Guys, we did it. Mm -hmm. Another week in Los Angeles. Anybody want to share something really quickly in four seconds? Racing to the airport. Me cool. Samesies. Celtics by double digits tonight. Double hey. digits? I got sure. <laughs> 40 I'll for be JT. I'll say 40 heat. for JT. That's going to do it for us. We'll be back Monday, 10 Eastern. Enjoy the week. Run it back, run it up, run it back, run it up, run it back, run it up.